Good morning, namaskar and welcome to the course once again. In the last lecture, if you remember, we did some problems based on simulation. In this lecture, we are going to understand the estimation process as far as a contractor is concerned. This is a very important topic because you will find that for a contractor, estimation is like his bread and butter. It is not that important for a client perspective, but when it comes to a contractor, it is a matter of life and death. The reason is, if his cost is overestimated, he may not be the lowest bidder, he may lose the bid. On the other hand, if he has underestimated the bid, it may so happen that he might get the project, but at the time of execution, he might be losing heavily. In fact, you will find that con construction is one of the riskiest business. There are a lot of uncertainties involved, there are a lot of risks involved in this business. So, you might find that a company which must be considered very good, maybe 20 years back, you may not even hear their names in today's context. So, one big mistake here and there in your tendering process, in your bidding process and you are gone, you are out of the market. They say that entry barrier in construction is very low. Here anyone can enter the business, maybe in the form of a labor contractor or maybe in the form of a material supplier or he may be supplying labor, material and equipment all or he may be a very big contractor. But he has to make sure that his estimation process is very, very accurate, very, very scientific and he must keep a track of everything that he assumes in his estimation process. So, in this lecture, we are going to learn an overall view of contractor's estimation process, how a contractor estimates the rate for a particular item, be it concrete, be it form work, be it reinforcement. We will see what are the inputs that are needed in order to estimate the cost, uh, how exactly he goes about it. So, let us say we start this process of bidding by assuming that there is a client and which wants to construct a facility. Now, this facility he can construct either by utilizing his own workforce or he can get it done through a contractor. So, the first method we call it as departmental working. So, let us say in the case of IIT, let us say IIT decides to come up with a lecture theater. Now, IIT also has its works department in place. So, they have got engineers, they have got supervisors, they have got workers as well. So, one option could be to get this lecture hall complex constructed by using its own workforce. The second option could be they can go in for a contractor. Now, in most of the situation you will find that for large construction works, it is always beneficial to go through contracting route. This is because it offers you lots of advantages, especially in situation where you have employed a large number of people and you do not have work. What will you do with those workmen? What will you do with those engineering workforce? So, that is the reason most of the government clients these days, they keep minimal staff on their roles and most of the time they get their work done through contracting agency. Now, for routine works, there is a process called open bidding, very small kind of work, maybe 1 crore, 2 crore or even 5 crores, routine works concreting, reinforcement, shuttering and so on. So, there are many agencies which can handle this kind of work. So, we go through open bidding route. However, for specialized work, you have to go with limited bidding or we call it as restrictive bidding. So, in this kind of bidding situation, there are only few contractors who are given the tender document only the pre-qualified bidders are issued the tender document. So, that brings us to a 
separate process called pre-qualification. Now, when it comes to pre-qualification, you want to ensure that only those contractors take part in the bidding process which have certain experience with them, which have got financial soundness, which possesses enough equipment, enough relevant staff, they do not have a bad track record, they are very good in their quality of work, they have a very good safety record. So, these are some of the pre-qualifying criteria which sometimes are utilized to pre-qualify a particular contractor or for that matter a set of contractors. So, our pre-qualification process starts and normally client would prepare a document in which the information from the contractors would be asked in a structured format. So, maybe you will have different forms in that particular document. Form A will be giving general description of the companies or the contractors business. Then there would be some other form which will give the financial detail of that particular company or that particular contractor. Uh, what are their turnovers? What is the profit that they made in last four or five years? Whether they are pay paying taxes in time or not? Uh, whether they have cleared their sales tax? All those issues are mentioned in a typical form. Then comes the list of staff that they have, their qualification, where they are posted right now. You would also like to know what kind of equipment they possess. So, you have a separate format for uh, giving you the details regarding the equipment. Then you also ask for their past experiences, what are the jobs that they have right now with them, whether they have been blacklisted by any one of the clients in the past, whether they have got uh, enough expertise, whether they have got in-house quality system, in-house safety management system and so on. So, essentially the purpose of carrying out this pre-qualification business is to know whether a particular contractor is good for a particular job or not. So, this bidding process in restrictive bidding starts with the notice of pre-qualification. Sometimes it is also known as request for qualification. So, what I will do is I will just give you an overview of the whole bidding process and then subsequently we go into the details of each of the steps and we will discuss that in detail. So, if you look at the overview part, you can see this flow chart of which will be like this. So, if you see here, this is how the process starts. So, as I told you, the notice for pre-qualification is the first step. So, a client normally issues a notice in the leading newspaper or sometimes uh, they write personal letters as well. Then the contractors after receiving this pre-qualification document, they prepare this document and they submit their pre-qualification proposal. Now, when the interested bidders submit their pre-qualification proposal, either they may be pre-qualified or they may not be pre-qualified. So, if they are not pre-qualified, the process ends there itself. So, the contractor who failed in this pre-qualification business, uh, he will stop then and there itself and then try to analyze what went wrong, what can be improved in future so that for such projects they get pre-qualified. Now, if the contractor gets pre-qualified, then only they will be invited to collect the tender document once it is ready. Now, after the contractor has received the tender document, they will prepare a tender summary. We will see what does this mean. Looking at the tender summary, the contractor will decide whether they should bid for this project or not. If they are not bidding for this project, a matter ends there, they will stop there. But if they have decided to bid for this particular project, then the further process starts. Then they will depute some of the engineers from their organization to go for site visit and investigation. There would be a team who will prepare the 
queries which are missing information from the tender documents, they will meet the clients, they will meet the architects and they will prepare questions for pre-bid inquiries or pre-bid meeting. We will see what does this pre-bid meeting mean. Thereafter, one of the contractors person would be preparing various schedules, the construction schedules, the plant and equipment schedule, the labor schedule, cash inflow and cash outflow schedules. We will see what kind of schedules they make. Uh, subsequently, during the site visit, the contractor's representative would collect the information on material cost, labor cost, plant and equipment cost and other information. By doing this, they will be in a position to determine the direct cost, they will also determine the indirect cost, they will try to estimate the markup depending on the job requirement, depending on the need of the company prevailing at that point of time. They will also see how to distribute this markup. We will see what does this markup means. For the time being, you just understand it as profit. So, we will see how to determine the profit percentage and how do we distribute it. Uh, although I am defining markup as profit right now, but it is more than profit as you will see in subsequent lectures. Once we have done all these things, then we submit our bid price. There could be two possibilities here again, either my bid is accepted. In that case, I will have to appoint my project team and execute the project. In case I am not awarded the project, I will again have to stop and analyze what went wrong and what we have learned from this whole process so that we can take corrective measures for the next bidding exercise. Now we will go back into each one of these steps and we will see the details pertaining to that. So let us go back to this particular slide and we see what does this pre-qualification means. As I have already told you, a pre-qualification involves selecting the appropriate contractor for bidding for a particular job. So the first step, if you see, you have to get involved in the pre-qualification process. Suppose IIT wants to construct a lecture hall complex and you are an interested bidder. So, you will contact IIT authorities and you will ask them to give you the pre-qualification document. Suppose you get pre-qualified out of this exercise and you have been invited to collect the tender document, then you send some of your representative to collect the tender document, the drawings and after receipt of these documents, we will prepare tender summary. Now, this tender summary is also sometimes known as tender at a glance, tender at a glance. So, whether you call it as tender summary or whether you call it as tender at a glance, they are the same thing. We will see subsequently what exactly we include in this document called tender at a glance. Now, once you have prepared the tender summary, we have to take certain decisions at this stage. Now, what are those decisions that we will see? Some of the decisions that you have to take at this stage is whether to bid or not to bid. That again is an important question to be answered at this stage. Because remember, you have still got time to say, sorry, I am not going to bid for this. But if you have decided to bid, then you have to carry out many more exercises. You will have to send someone straight away to go for site investigation. So normally one senior engineer and one slightly junior engineer will head to the exact site location to find the physical condition of site. They will see whether any encumbrances are at site, whether any encroachments is at site. What is the physical status of Nala? Is there any transmission line tower there? Is there any encroachment there? Is there any drain passing through my site? So all these things are noted at the time of investigating the site. Sometimes I will collect some sample from site. I will also meet people there 
I will meet local administration there, police, fire brigade, telephone department, patrol and so on. You have to meet so many people because remember today in case you get the job, you will have to mobilize thousands of workers there, hundreds of engineers there. So until unless you are very much clear about the surroundings of the site, the environment of the site, you will not be able to do justice with the project. Now once you have carried out for site visit and investigation, then you prepare different questions to raise to the client so that they get clarified and you have more clarity in bidding for the project. And as I told you, subsequently you will have to prepare various schedules. We will see what kind of schedules we have to prepare. We have to collect information and then we have to determine our bid price. Now we will go into the details of each of these steps and uh, we will see uh, what to do next. Now suppose we have collected the tender document. Now what to do with this? Now when you see the tender document, it consists of many documents. So there would be general conditions of contract. Sometimes we call this as GCC. Then you have special conditions of contract, which is also known as SCC. Then you will have a document called specifications then you will have the bill of quantities and then you will have the drawings for the project. So you find this is quite a bulky document. This may be running in thousands of pages, maybe 2000, 3000 pages. Now going through each of these pages is not possible. Why it is not possible? Because the time that is given to us to prepare the tender document is very short. You will be told to submit your bid maybe in two to three weeks time. So it is not possible to do so much of reading besides carrying out site investigation and other activities in such a short time. So as an experienced professional, you have to find out what informations to look into various documents such as the GCC, the SCC, the specifications, bill of quantities and the drawings of the project. Not all documents will be part of your tender document if the type of contract is different. For example, in lump sum contract, you may not be given the bill of quantities. You have to generate your own bill of quantities. These documents you will get if you are quoting for an item rate project. There is a contract called item rate project, item rate contract. So under this type of contract, the client will give you the general conditions of contract, the special conditions of contract, the specifications, the bill of quantities and the drawings, right. Now looking at these documents and the set of drawings, we will also see what set of drawings are available to us. There are different sets of drawing. You will have architectural drawing, you will have a structural drawing, you have drawing for services. Uh, there are plenty of drawings. Now, you have to quickly go through these drawings also and any ambiguity that you find in the drawings that need to be clarified. Because if you do not get clarification at this stage, uh, it may be problematic to you at a time of execution. You might be incurring heavy losses on account of your lack of understanding of drawings or if you find there is ambiguity in the drawings. Now I tell you looking at those documents, what exactly information we seek from those documents. So we say that we have to prepare tender at a glance or tender summary. Now when we look at these documents, we try to look for the general information related to client. Who are the clients? What is their address? Who are the consultant? What are their address? Uh, where are their offices located? Uh, what type of work they have been doing in the past, what is their track record. Likewise, you will also try to find regarding the architect's credential. You will also look for various commercial terms like mobilization advance. Uh, is the client giving you mobilization advance? If yes, what percentage of the contract value? Uh, is it interest bearing? Is it interest free? What are the terms of recovery of this mobilization advance? That means from which bill onwards the client is going to deduct the mobilization advance. 
uh, you will also see whether the client is giving you any plant and machinery advance. What happens sometimes in your project if let us say you require some kind of specialized equipment, the client may tell you to buy that and for that they may sometime even extend you some kind of advance also that may be interest free advance. Likewise, sometimes they also give you material advance especially for non perishable materials. Then you also have to look for information on taxes and duties, whether the rates that you are going to quote should include all the taxes prevailing at that particular time, whether it should include all the duties prevailing at that particular time. Then you also have to look for information on terms of payment, whether the client is going to pay you monthly payment or they are going to pay you bi-monthly payment or it could be even fortnightly payment, all these things we have to note it down. You also have to find out what is the provision of escalation, what happens uh, in case the prices of labor, material and uh, other materials such as uh, petrol, oil, lubricants, they change. What is the provision on liquidated damages? Uh, now these liquidated damages are the penalties that the client would impose in case you are delaying their projects. Normally they charge it at the rate of uh, 0.5% per week. So that means every week that you delay the project, the client would charge you 0.5%. Normally, they also have a maximum limit for this. So, they will say okay, 0.5 percent per week subject to a maximum of 10 percent. Now, you also be looking at the bonus clauses. Normally, whenever you find there is a liquidated damages clause in your contract, you also find a bonus clause. So, bonus clause would typically read it like this that for every one week early completion of project, the client would give you maybe 0.25 percent of the contract value subject to maybe 5 percent of the total contract value. So, these are the things that we have to look in in your contract document. Now, you also have to look for information on arbitration and dispute resolution. What happens in case there is a dispute between the contractor and the client? How to resolve it? Normally, in these days, there is a clause which says that the client would nominate one arbitrator the contractor would nominate one arbitrator and these two arbitrators put together they will uh, engage one more brother arbitrator. So, there will always be an odd number of arbitrator in a particular project. So, these are the ways and means through which you try to resolve the dispute. So, you will look whether such mechanism exists in my project or not. Then uh, you will also see the information on insurance. These days you have to buy certain kind of insurance to make sure that the project does not suffer. So, you have to buy insurance policies such as uh, contractors all risk policy, we call this as car policy. So, C stands for contractor, A stands for all and R stands for risk. So, contractors all risk policy. So, a uh, contractor is covered under uh, different uh, calamities. Uh, that may be possible on that particular site. The contractor is also covered against any type of theft or any type of uh, disaster such as flood or fire and so on. Now, the another type of policy which a contractor has to buy these days is uh, the workman compensation. So, all your workers need to be insured. So, all these policies require some premium to be paid. Uh, as part of the contractor's expense. Then the third type of insurance policy that a contractor has to buy is called third party liability. So, let us say any third person if it enters a site and gets injured or something happens to them, they are also covered. So, you have to see whether your contract document requires you to purchase these uh, insurance policies. What are the three insurance policies that we mentioned? The common ones are contractors all risk policy, workman compensation and third party liability. Now, you also have to find the information on facilities to be provided at site. What happens to labor accommodation? Who is going to provide hutment to the laborers? Whether the land is available? 
if it is available, what is the rent that the client will charge? Then we also have to look for services such as water. Is water available at site? Is electricity available at site? If yes, at what point contractor will get the water connection? At what point the contractor will get electricity connection? All these are very, very important. Remember why? Because each one of this involves certain cost. So, when we are preparing tender summary, we must collect all those documents, all those information which essentially has a bearing on price. So, anything you think is going to affect your cost, is going to affect your bid price, you should write in this particular piece of paper. Now, once you have compiled all this information, this goes to your bosses. So, higher ups in the contractors hierarchy, those people will go through this document. This document would be roughly of about 15 to 20 pages, highlighting all those key points which I mentioned. Now, going through these key points, the management would decide, the contractors top management would decide whether it is good for us to bid for this particular project or not. So, now you can see there are many important decisions that have to be taken at this point of time. For example, whether to bid for your project or not, that itself is a big decision. If you have decided not to bid, fine, the chapter ends there. You will have to just send a regret letter to the client saying that, sorry, this time it did not work out and next time we will look to get associated with you. Some other decisions that you have to make is, once you have decided to bid, you will ask the question whether you will be in a position to bid independently or in a joint venture. Now, this is the time to decide looking at the scope of the work, whether you can handle the whole work independently or whether you are trying to look for some partner who can strengthen your bid potential. So, if you are not very good in let us say tunneling job, you would like to partner with some foreign agency who has got good expertise in tunneling job. So, now you will write to the client that look for this project, so and so company would be responsible for this particular activity and so and so company would be responsible for the remaining ones. So, we call this as a joint venture arrangement. Now, the third decision that you have to take is you have to look for those items which need subcontracting. Now, this subcontracting is another very important decision you have to take it at this particular stage. For example, you will find that not all works will be carried out by the general contractor. There are certain items which needs support from sub specialized agencies. We call them as subcontractors, we call them as specialty contractors. For example, the anti-termite treatment. Another example could be waterproofing. Then it could be aluminum composite paneling, ACP works. Likewise, you will have to identify out of the total scope of the project, which items you will be in a position to do it on your own and which items you want to give it on a subcontract. So, that decision also we have to take it at this point of time. In some cases, contract document itself will mention what items you need to be subcontracting. Sometimes even they will specify the name of the subcontractors also. In such cases, we call those subcontractors as nominated subcontractors. The other decision that we have to take at this stage is to prepare the construction methodology how exactly I will handle this particular project, what equipment I am going to bring, what technology I am going to bring. Because remember, depending on your technology, your prices are going to change. Now, as a, as a prudent contractor, you will be very careful about choosing a particular construction methodology. Because this is where you will find your prices are going to be different compared to other agencies. So, you have to spend lot of time in deciding the appropriate material, the appropriate methodology and the appropriate uh, technology that you are likely to adopt for your 
project. So, these are the decisions we have to take at this point of time. Now, after you have decided to bid for the project and you have decided that you are going to do it on your own with of course, some little percentage for subcontractors, then the next step is to go for site investigation. So, as I told you, you would like to physically inspect the site location. So, basically the site investigation process is a very important process and it starts the moment you come out of your office for the actual site location. So, you will carry with you the tender at a glance and you will go to the site. Now, on the way itself, you will also have to look for many things. For example, you will see how to reach the site location from your present location, whether rail routes are available, whether highways are available, whether air routes are available, whether uh, water routes are available. Now, I am not saying this because you alone are going. You have to think in a way that tomorrow if you get the project, you have to transport hundreds of tons of materials, hundreds of equipment, thousands of workers. So, you must be familiar with all the possible routes to carry the material, to carry the equipment and to carry your staff. On the way, you will also look at different infrastructure. For example, you will see whether any bridge is existing on the route to your site. Is there any restriction on the height? Is there any restriction on the tonnage? Suppose there is a bridge and which requires only 20 ton to be transported. In that case, it may sometimes so happen that your heavier equipment may have to be dismantled into two. So, again you can see its cost implication. Earlier your equipment was to go in one trailer, now it will go in two trailers. So, you will have to incur extra cost. So, you have to keep your eyes and ears open when you go for site investigation. Now, once you reach the site, you have to do many, many tasks. Let us see what are the tasks that you have to carry out. You have to see the condition of site. You have to see the position of existing services. You have to see how the ground conditions look like. You will also see the availability of labor in the vicinity of site, whether different types of labors are available. Are they skilled? Do they have any special skills? What are their working times? How many numbers you can mobilize? You can also assess the security and law and order situation. Sometimes depending on the security and law and order situation, your prices may be different. You will also see how to reach the site, the topographical details of the site, availability of water and power, the facilities available for waste and excess earth disposal. You will also see if you have to demolish any temporary work or temporary buildings. Then during the investigation process, we also collect the general information related to site, information on taxes, duties and tariffs. If you have been working in a particular country, most of the time you will be knowing. However, let us say if you are bidding for a project outside India, then in that case you have to have all these information. We will also have to collect information on laws and regulations. For example, let us say if you are doing a project in Delhi and the project requires lot of concreting work, then you will also see in what time you are supposed to be carrying the concrete from one place to other place, because there are restrictions during daytime you cannot transport concrete. So, all these things will affect your working at site. Then you also have to find the information pertaining to weather, what kind of weather is prevailing at site. Sometimes at some places you will find there will be rains 6 months out of the 12 months. So, you have to have a different strategy there. In some cases there would be a snowfall for 3 months out of 12 months. So, you have to have a separate strategy, maybe you will have to plan for only 9 months working in those locations. So, these things are very, very important. 
Then you also find information on public utilities and services. You have to collect information on different types of materials, their availability, you will have to collect the rates at site, you will have to collect information on site topography, sometimes you may have to do some kind of soil investigation also. Then you also have to collect basic inputs for estimating material rates, we will see what are the information that we need to collect. Then information on site facilities like where I am going to put my labor hutment, where I am going to put my staff quarters, I will have to collect information on labor availability and their rates. I will also have to look for various subcontractors availability and their rates for different items. These things we will be using while preparing our rates. Then we will also see what kind of plant and machinery are available at that particular location, what are their rates. We will also see whether any repair facility exists at that particular location or not. So you see you have to do a lot of activity once you reach the project site. These things take a lot of time and you need to have past experience to do these things faster. Remember these inputs are going to be utilized by your tendering team. So they are waiting for your feedback and then only they can start actually working out the rates for individual items. Now while some one or two staff are already carrying out the site investigation, there is another team working out at the office level. So what are the job they are supposed to be doing? One person they will go through all the tender documents and they will find out whether they, there are any ambiguities observed in let us say either the GCC or specifications or even drawings. So they will go on listing out those queries because before submission of tender normally the client would convene a meeting which is known as pre-bid meeting. So just before submission of bid the client would like to call all the contractors with their queries and they would try to clarify those queries before the bid submission so that they can get a very reasonable price. So for this pre-bid meeting most of the clients they would ask the contractors to submit their queries in a structured format in written form. Now in the pre-bid meeting the client would also invite its architect, its other consultants like structural consultants, the client may have some services consultants. So everyone will be invited besides the various participating contractors. So each of these queries will be addressed and a consolidated reply will be prepared by the client and it will be distributed to all the participating contractors. Normally in pre-bid meeting, if the contractors like extension for bid submission time, they also request this is the right time to request for the extension of bid preparation time. So most of the time they will say, okay, this two or three weeks is not sufficient, why do not you give us one week extra. So depending on the urgency of the work, sometimes the client would agree, sometimes the client would disagree. So they will tell you finally when exactly the bid has to be submitted. So by that date, all the processes by a contractor must be completed. Now in the meantime, some other activities are also to be performed. For example, you know there is earnest money deposit which has to be submitted along with your bid. Now this earnest money deposit is also sometimes referred to as bid bond. Now in large organizations, preparing these earnest money deposit is also time consuming. You have to fill up a form that look I am quoting for a, this particular project, this requires this much earnest money deposit in the form of either cash or in the form of demand draft or maybe in the form of even bank guarantee. So it has to go through different approval levels. So you have to carry out all these tasks parallelly. Then another document that you have to submit is called power of attorney who will sign the tender document on behalf of contractor. So depending on the value of the project, the contractor's top management 
issues power of attorney in the favor of a particular person. So, that person becomes authorized to sign the tender document. So, that document also you have to prepare because without these documents client is not going to accept your bid. So, we will see what are the other things that we need to carry out. So, as I have told you uh, the contractor has to prepare for the earnest money deposit and as I told you in large companies it has to go through various stages and then only it gets prepared. Now, the estimator you will find has to get the inputs from a number of departments within the organization also because rate estimation is a collective process. So, there would be a purchase department in the contractors organization. So, that particular department will tell the contractors bidding team that look cement is available at this price at this location, steel is available at this price at this particular location. So, whatever is the major purchases that will be governed by the purchase department. So, you have to get the input from the purchase department. Then for freezing the construction methodology, you have to contact the construction method and planning cell. So, these people they will go through the tender documents, they will see what are the jobs requirement, they will prepare the semantic diagrams for carrying out complicated tasks and then based on that systematic process the bidding team will calculate the cost. So, there is involvement of purchase department, there is involvement of construction method and planning cell, then you will have to also consult your plant and machinery department, what type of equipment needs to be mobilized, what is the higher charge for that, is that equipment available to us, if yes for how many months, what are the higher charges, whether the operators are available or whether I have to get it on a rental basis from some agency, if yes what is the higher charge. Now, one very important task that you have to carry out at this stage to collect the information from your subcontractors. So, you have decided that task A, task B, task C are to be carried out by different subcontractors. So, all the information pertaining to task A, I will compile it in one document and I will send it to different subcontractors for their rates. So, I will say okay, I want to carry out waterproofing, this type of waterproofing, uh, 1000 square meter at this location, please send us your rates. So, this process is also on simultaneously. So, we are working on multiple fronts. Ultimately, we want our bid to be very, very responsive, responsive bid. That means, neither it is too high nor it is too low. We want to be as accurate as possible because remember whether I am getting the bid or not is going to depend on this entire exercise, right. Now, what we need to do is I have already told you about the power of attorney. So, you have to collect the power of attorney because the client would except the signature of only that person who has got the power of attorney. I have already told you about the method statement. Sometimes you may have to go for alternative design and you may have to prepare alternative drawings. And once these are prepared, the estimator will be able to take off the quantities corresponding to each of these schemes and thereby it will be able to calculate the cost. You will also have to find out ambiguities to present it at the time of pre-bid meetings. This is also known to you. As I have told you in the pre-bid meeting, all the stakeholders such as the project management firm, the architects, the service consultants, they are all invited and it is always better to send the copies of the queries in advance in written form. So, that the respective stakeholders can prepare the reply and keep it ready. While we are working on all multiple fronts, we also have to work out the construction schedule for the proposed project. So, for preparing the construction schedule, you already are familiar, you have to split the projected quantities on the bar chart, you will have to then find out the cash inflow and the cash outflow. This is also 
already discussed in one of the lectures in this particular course. Uh, we will prepare the labor schedule, we will prepare the plant schedule, we will prepare the subcontractor schedule. So, when you say you have to prepare schedule means it has to say at what point of time how many labors would be required. So, month 1 how many workers, month 2 how many workers, month 3 how many workers. Likewise, when you say plant schedule you will see which plant is needed at what point of time. In month 1 which plant? how many days you will keep this particular plant, when is it going to be demobilized. Likewise, you will do for subcontracting also. So, this subcontractor you want it in month 5, they will be there for 2 months. Likewise, next subcontractor you want from month 3 onwards up to month 7. So, this is how you prepare different types of schedule. Then for finding the indirect cost, we will see what they mean. You also have to estimate the stock, how much will be the requirement of basic materials, what kind of temporary structures we are planning, how much will be the cost involved in that, what kind of spares, tools and tackles and fuel we require, how much would be the money required for each of these tasks, what kind of fixed assets we need to mobilize, uh, how much outstanding you perceive it to be in your particular project vendor credit, unadjusted advance, all these things will be part of your uh, indirect cost. Now, as I told you at the site, you will have to collect information on material, because material component is one of the important components in any cost breakup. Uh, it is about 50 to 60 percent of your total project cost. So, when you inquire about a particular material, you will have to find out what is the basic cost at which that material is available, what are the various taxes, what is the wastage that you foresee in such materials, what are the different taxes, what are the different duties, all such things will be part of your cost working. So, these are the information we collect as far as information on material pricing is concerned. Then we move on to the labor. So, first you have to calculate the labor requirement, you will also estimate some productivity. So, for example, if you are doing concreting, how many men are needed to do 1 cubic meter of concrete, all such data has to be collected both for a skilled as well as for unskilled worker. Whether you will like to get the work done through your departmental worker or whether you want to hire the workers on subcontract basis. How many plant operators and helpers would be needed? whether you would require mates, masons, carpenter, fitters, helpers, etcetera, or whether you will get these work done through subcontractors labor. So, all these things are part of your labor information. Then comes your plant and equipment data. So, you will find what kind of plant and equipment are needed for the completion of the project, so that you can complete this project within the defined duration. You will also have to estimate their output. For this, you may have to consult the manufacturer's literature or you may have to consult the past data from your project sites. And you also have to carry out the information on the most economical manner to carry out the works. So, these are some of the informations that we need to collect for working out the cost of different items. So, we will stop at this particular point, but I will quickly summarize what we learnt in this particular lecture. If you remember, we have discussed the contractor's costing process in this particular lecture. I have also given you an overview of bidding process as far as a contractor is concerned. It starts with the notice for pre-qualification. After a contractor has been pre-qualified, it collects the tender document. Once it has collected the tender document, it prepares the tender summary or tender at a glance. It consists of all those information which are needed, so that you do not make mistake in pricing. So, all those things which affect the cost are listed out in this particular document. Once you have collected this document, I mean prepared this document, you take it to your bosses. Based on this document, they decide whether to bid for this particular project or not. If yes, whether to bid it independently or in a joint venture. 
if you are bidding independently, what portion of it you will subcontract. So, these are the information that they have to take at this stage. Once they have decided to bid for the project, they will depute someone to go for site investigation. At site investigation, you collect various information. You collect information so that it becomes helpful for you to cost the material part, the labor part, plant and equipment part and subcontractor part. In the meantime, you also consult other people within your own organization. For example, you consult your purchase people to know what are the prices prevailing for cement, for steel and some other major items. You talk to your persons in construction methodology department, what method to follow so that it results in economical construction. You also have to consult your accounts department so that your earnest money deposit is in place. You collect the power of attorney. So, you find it is a whole lot of collective exercise that needs to be performed. In the next class, we will tell you how to compile all these information to arrive at the bid price. So, till then, we stop at this point and thank you very much and see you some other time. Thank you.